Hey, everyone out there. I want to welcome you to another special episode done as a collaboration with the Parthenon Podcast Network. This is a roundtable episode on what movie, historical-based movie, we would like to see made. It features Mark Vinette, Scott Rank, and Richard Lim of the History of North America and Historical Jesus podcast, History Unplugged, and the This American President podcasts, respectively. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. I would also love to hear what you think about this episode and what historical movie you would love to see be made and on what era and all of that. I that's It's a fascinating topic. Enjoy this episode, and I will talk to you next time. Hollywood is calling and the top producers have a huge task. They want to know what movies history podcasters want to make. The sky is the limit. You can make a movie based on any historical event or character you desire. What will it be? We are here to find out what movies some of the top history podcasters in the genre today would choose to produce if they were given this amazing opportunity. We are joined today by Mark Vinette, host of two great podcasts, The History of North America and Historical Jesus Podcast, Scott Rank, host of The History Unplugged Podcast, and Richard Lim, host of This American President Podcast. So we'll go through each one of our podcasters is going to make their pitch for their movie and describe it. And then as any good pitch meeting will go, the rest of us will try to pick all the faults in their particular choice of movie. So we're going to start off today with our rookie and our first person to join us in the Parthenon podcast roundtable, Mark Vinette of the History of North America podcast and Historical Jesus podcast. Well, thank you so much, Steve. If I could produce a movie about any historic event or figure, what or who would it be? Gentlemen, I give you George Washington. Woo! There's Yay. never been... Yep. I know I'm stepping a bit on your toes, Richard, and I hope you don't mind, but... No, all good. There's never been an A-plus Hollywood production on Washington, similar to the film Lincoln, with Daniel Day-Lewis and a slew of big-name actors like Tommy Lee Jones and Sally Fields. I think Washington deserves the Steven Spielberg treatment, who directed Lincoln. Staying away from the cradle-to-grave biopic formula, I would focus instead on one particular period in George Washington's life with flashbacks to his early adventures. Although I'm well aware that no such film could or would be made in this present-day statue-toppling era, this roundtable tonight has given me the opportunity to dream big so American history can once again be celebrated on film. The title I would go for is simple, Washington. That's it, that's all. The plot of the movie begins and ends in Newburgh, New York on March 15th, 1783, during the waning days of the American Revolution, with flashbacks covering the main events of 51 years of Washington's life from birth to 1783, including the traumatic death of his father, in 1743, when he was just 11 years old. In 1751, while still a teenager, he embarked on his only trip abroad with when he accompanied his older beloved brother Lawrence to Barbados, hoping the climate would cure his brother's tuberculosis. Washington contracted smallpox during that trip, which immunized him, but left his face slightly scarred. Lawrence, unfortunately, died in 1752, and Washington leased the Virginia plantation Mount Vernon from his widow. He inherited the property outright after her death in 1761. Now, as a young man in 1753, Washington was appointed a special envoy on behalf of the British to the Ohio Valley to deal with the French and Iroquois Indians. 
The next year, he was promoted to lieutenant colonel and second in command of the 300 strong Virginia Regiment with orders to confront French forces at the forks of the Ohio, which sparked the French and Indian War. His harrowing adventures during this campaign transformed him, in my opinion, into a modern day action hero who escaped near death on several occasions. These escapades could effectively be put on film by a talented director like Steven Spielberg. At age 26, he married Martha Dandridge Custis, the 27-year-old widow of a wealthy plantation owner, and proceeded to become one of the richest men on the continent. As a prominent community political leader, he participated, as we all know, in the leading up to the revolution and was appointed commander-in-chief in 1775 of the colonial forces. And the rest, as they say, is well-known revolutionary history that could be dramatically captured in a thrilling, action-packed popcorn flick. So, as mentioned, the film would be set in Newburgh. George Washington's 1783 Newburgh Address was one of the most important and dramatic speeches in his military career. The soldiers who gathered in Newburgh were tired, bloody, homesick, and unpaid. They were also on the brink of mutiny. Prior to Washington's speech, the soldiers had circulated petitions criticizing the Continental Congress and contemplating widespread insubordination. When Washington heard of these mutinous rumblings, he was horrified. A large-scale mutiny by American soldiers would shatter the public's confidence in the military, vindicate Great Britain's skepticism about the American experiment, and tarnish the young nation in the eyes of the world. Explaining his decision to address the soldiers in Newburgh to Alexander Hamilton, Washington wrote, I was obliged to rescue them from plunging themselves into a gulf of civil horror from which there might be no receding. On March 15, 1783, Washington delivered this address to the senior officers of the Continental Army. In his speech, Washington emphasized many themes that he returned to throughout his career, including the importance of public duty, honor, civilian control of the military, and civic Republican virtue. At a key moment in the speech, also to be the key moment of my film, Washington reached into his pocket and revealed for the first time that he had begun wearing glasses, saying, Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have grown not only gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. Many soldiers apparently were moved to tears in this dramatic moment, and that is how I would end the movie. When I look back at the movies, miniseries, and TV shows that featured George Washington in the past, it's almost disappointing. It's mostly disappointing. Portrayals of the general prior to the 1980s were mostly one-dimensional, reverential cameos or statuesque walk-on parts, as was the case for Jesus, for example, prior to the 1960s. Remember Ben-Hur with Charlton Heston? They never even show the face of Jesus. It wasn't until 40 years ago that Washington finally got his first real full-length biopic treatment. But the 1984 miniseries that chronicled his life has not aged well, and although actor Barry Bostwick possessed Washington's physical attributes, he lacked his gravitas, bearing, and stature. Talented actress Patty Duke was excellent, by the way, as his wife Martha. In the 2008 HBO series John Adams, Washington's portrayal by American actor David Morse was interesting but not great. A solid B+, plus, but not an A+. Plus. Although I enjoyed the recent TV series Turn, Washington Spies, American actor Ian Kahn's portrayal was a little too politically correct and overly sensitive for me. The real General Washington was a tough dude and action-adventure hero, not some whimpering, introspective, soul-searching soy boy. My choice of actors for my big-budget blockbuster would include or could have included Liam Neeson or Hugh Jackman, 
but they are too old for the flashback sequences featuring a young Washington. Oppenheimer star Cillian Murphy is an interesting choice, but he's only five feet seven inches tall, while the real Washington stood an impressive six feet two, which is quite tall for the time period. Swedish actor Alexander Skarsgård makes for an interesting choice, but my ultimate pick would be the dashing 40-year-old six-feet-one British actor Henry Cavill, a.k.a. Superman, who also appeared in the excellent The Tudors TV drama. My choice of female actors or actresses, and I never know if we should call women actors or actresses. I guess it's like pronouns. That's a bit confusing. Anyway, English actress Kate Beckinsale is a favorite of mine, but entering her fifth decade, she is too old for the flashback sequences featuring a young Martha. At 40, Emily Blunt makes for an interesting choice, and so does young British Oppenheimer actress Florence Pug, who has the diminutive stature of Martha, who as a girl of 18 was about five feet tall, no more, dark-haired, and she was gentle of manner. Emma Watson, of Harry Potter fame, may not have the acting chops to pull it off, but I always find her easy on the eyes. My ultimate pick, however, is the talented British actress of Game of Thrones fame, Amelia Clark, who I think would make a wonderful wife to the father of the American nation. So there you have it, gentlemen. Oh, and by the way, I would hire Richard Lim as the film's historical consultant. <laughs> And now, a word from our sponsors. I appreciate that. It's really interesting that you bring up that it's taking one scene, basically, and focusing it around that Newburgh address. I think that was one of the failings for Lincoln, is that they tried to cover too much. I think that focusing that would make it, there really has never been anything done like that. Kind of, there was a miniseries with Jeff Daniels, I want to say in maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, but that was a kind of a lower budget affair that this is the big blowout that George Washington deserves. It was around Dumb and Dumber Jeff Daniels era. Yeah, and it was hard to imagine him as Washington because of the Dumb and Dumber hit movie, but I think he did a good job. It was a TV movie, which was well made, but not the big budget blockbusters I'm planning to make. So I have many, many thoughts on this. So Mark, thanks for bringing it up because you're absolutely right. The father of the nation has not had a film that is equal to his stature as an American president and the father of the nation. A few thoughts. The first thought is that I actually, I know a professor and he teamed up with a screenwriter and actually wrote a script about the Newberg conspiracy specifically. So there is a script out there And the professor's name is James Kirby Martin, who's a wonderful man, great professor, and he specializes on that. So it's out there. But the other thing I was going to say is that Ronald Maxwell, the director of the film Gettysburg, classic film, 1993, and Gods and Generals, he actually was going to direct a movie about George Washington. And he had a guy who did a screen test. The actor's name is Jillian Vanover. J-I-L-O-N, first name, Vanover, V-A-N-O-V-E-R. And he actually did a screen test where he does the Newberg speech. And it was filmed in 2005. And he actually posted it on his social media on Instagram. You can actually watch him doing the Newberg speech. And so this movie was going to be made in 2005. And then it wasn't made. And so it's very unfortunate. But It would have been around the same time as the John Adams miniseries. And I think your recommendations are great. I never thought about Henry Cavill. I don't know how people feel about this, but I always felt that maybe a younger Christian Bale would have been a great choice for George Washington. He just kind of has, to me, he just kind of seems to have some of the same features as Washington did. And he's six foot, so he's a little short, but, you know, he's not too short, I think, for the role. So I didn't know he was that tall. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he's kind of metamorphic. I mean, he played Dick Cheney for crying out loud in a movie. But at any rate, yeah, just some of those thoughts. But yeah, that it would be so fascinating. I wish they would have made the movie at some point. 
I'm imagining the American psycho Christian Bale. Look at that powdered wig, the subtle off-white coloring, the tasteful thickness of it. Oh, yeah. A man can dream. But yeah, you could do anything. <laughs> now, do you guys think that a movie like this could be made in 2023 in our present political climate? Well, they would force you to put certain aspects into it. And I think we know what aspects that would be. And they would probably have a big role in the movie. I think it would be a lot harder to make it now. The pendulum would have to swing back in Hollywood because we all know what it's like there. It would focus exclusively on his relationship with slaves and, right. you know, take 2023 political issues. Exclusively is the right word, yes. <laughs> I will say Turn was okay. You mentioned that. And there is some shoehorning of contemporary events. And when I watched it, I thought I can just imagine the studio notes and producers trying to make it even worse than what it was. So... One of the writers of the show, it was based on a book called Washington Spies, and the author was also a writer. So I talked to him briefly, and it sounded like he was really doing his best to keep it as true as possible. But with producers and their greasy fingers all over everything, it's hard. One brief thing I'll mention real quickly, in anticipation of this conversation, I went to ChatGPT and I asked it what 10 casting recommendations it would make. And we have a lot here that have already been mentioned, and Jeff Daniels is actually on there, which confused me at first, but I guess... Since he was in that mini series, it makes sense. But y'all want to hear some of the other titles? Some of them are good. Some of them are a little baffling. Yeah, great. We'll see how uh, computers still don't quite understand humans. So Liam Neeson is on there. Hugh Jackman, Russell Crowe. Then you have uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, which already being Lincoln, that's kind of greedy. You have Brian Cranston. So we can get Heisenberg as George Washington. Very interesting. Gary Oldman. Tom Hanks, I don't really buy it. That doesn't work for me. He doesn't have the gravitas, I think, to do that. Viggo Mortensen, Aragorn himself, the king of Gondor and Arnor. That is something that could pull me along. The most interesting one on there was Denzel Washington, which, hey, if we're going for colorblind casting like they do in the Hamilton musical, that is a scenario where I could see it working. Otherwise, it feels like Chad GPT is just pulling from a list of top 10 richest movie stars and it crumbled it all into this so anyway that's what the internet thinks you have the same last name and denzel washington is from mount vernon new york just like george washington is from obviously mount vernon virginia but there you go <laughs> well if anyone could pull it off it's denzel washington but i find he along with the other choices that chat gpt gave you might be a bit too old for my formula, which is he's in, he's 51. He's 51 when the event occurs in Newburgh and I'm flashing back. So that's why I thought Henry Cavill would be a good choice because he's 40 years old and he could, of course, pull off a 51 year old Washington and he can also pull off an 18 or 22 or 25 year old Washington. That's true. Yeah, that's the thing with these movies. Like with the Irishman, when they had Robert De Niro, who was, I think he's well in excess of 80 years old, playing a 20 year old guy, all the CGI in the world is not going to make him look like a 20 year old. There's a little bit of uncanny valley there. And don't forget, since Henry Cavill played Superman at Clark Kent, he's used to putting on glasses, which is key for the Newberg scene where Washington puts the spectacles on. <laughs> yeah, that whole business of having the mustache digitally removed for Superman with the reshoots because of Mission Impossible. So he can handle, you know, different looks, having teeth, not having teeth, go all sorts of different directions. I'm sold. It's Henry Cavill. No, there it is. We got it. Call us Hollywood. And he needs work because he's not Superman anymore. Yeah, that's right. It's not on The Witcher anymore. And you'll notice that a lot of my choices were British actors. I don't know if that's because that's where all the fine actors come from, or but they don't have problems with uh, American accents. So, And that's one thing I'd be curious. I'd really be curious to hear Washington's accent. Do you have anything on that, Richard? I know you've never heard the accent. It's never been recorded, of course, but we're talking about mid-18th century Virginia. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I mean, he was a fourth generation American by that point. I mean, the most I know about his voice is that it was pretty breathy. He apparently, well, earlier in his life when he suffered from, I'm not sure what it was, tuberculosis or something, it kind of left him. But 
I've heard that he did have a British accent, so who knows? Well, yeah. His particular accent, there's a book I read about a year ago called Albion Seed, which I highly recommend, and it talks about the different migration patterns from England to America. So you have the Scotch-Irish in Appalachia from the border between Scotland and Ireland and Northern Ireland, the Virginian Royalists, the Puritans from another part of England, Anglia, and the Pennsylvania Quakers. And each of these different populations mostly had a distinct accent, which they've largely retained. And for British people to come to America in the 1700s, 1800s was very odd for them because these regional accents from the 1600s were mostly still alive in the colonies. So if you were to go to an area, if you were going to go to Brooklyn and people sound like some silent era actress with a ridiculous over-the-top accent like Harley Quinn from Batman, that kind of uh, accent still lived on in America. So there were some interesting artifacts floating around there, which also is an aspect of Washington that as long as we're sort of talking about dream casting, my dream is if it could really follow the themes of the Ron Chernow book and the way that the Lincoln movie followed the Doris Kearns Goodwin book and focus on the team of rivals thing of Lincoln bringing different people together. I think Washington, you have an America that's really not in America. You have people that don't really feel loyalty to a larger cause. They're just friends of convenience that have a common enemy. But Washington's incredible self-sacrifice, so when he's putting on his spectacles of the speech that we mentioned earlier, and when people could see that he was risking his fortune, his sacred honor, his personal health and everything, that's the the sacrifice was the thing that knit together and sustained a group of people that otherwise I don't think would have stayed together, especially in hard times like Valley Forge. Just going back to that book you mentioned, I'll Be in Seed. What a great title for a book. Yeah. Recommend to listeners. Check it out. All right. So we've heard Mark's pitch for George Washington. Next up, we're going to have Scott Rank give his pitch for a historical movie. Yeah. So my person is by far the biggest blank slate of the people who will be discussed tonight. Most of you, I'm sure, have never heard of this person, but... He's one of my favorite historical figures. There's a book about him called The Sense of the World that is one of my favorite history books. It's definitely in my top five. I looked at the name of the author, but he escapes me right now. But if you just Google A Sense of the World, you'll find about James Holman. So James Holman was a traveler. He did exploration throughout Europe, North America, Africa, Australia, South America, in the Regency era, approximately from the early 1800s to about the 1830s. And he traveled about 250,000 miles approximately, so the distance from the Earth to the Moon. And he did it all completely blind. So I don't want to completely retell his life story, but just to hit some of the beat so you can get a sense of what I'm thinking of movie-wise. He did have a sight. He was born with it. He was part of the Royal Navy and fought in the Revolutionary War, was up along the North Atlantic coast, so frigid waters. Developed some sort of bacterial infection. We don't know what it is. Lost his sight in his mid-20s. And at this time, most people would have been left destitute. You'd be left begging. But he wanted to look for all the ways that he could put his life back together. And one thing he determined to do was to train himself to operate in society and not become a beggar. But he would walk around with his military uniform, try to take all the respect that was owed a naval officer. And there was nothing like a blind person's walking stick back then. He instead he had a gentleman's walking stick, the accoutrement. And what he would do is he would walk on stone streets and strike the ground hard that would produce a sharp, distinct sound. And he found out pretty early on that that would give him an echo. And he basically trained his brain to operate like a bat or a dolphin and use echolocation. And after six months, a year or two, it was remarkable what he could do. He could distinguish between a dog and a cart coming, if there was a carriage coming along the road, he could walk into a restaurant. There'd be a friend of his waiting at the other side of it, and he would somehow know to navigate there. So once he's able to function, he joins a retired veterans order that gives him a modest stipend, and he has to take leave of the warm hot springs of Europe to recover his health. And this is where he starts traveling. So he goes to France. He summits Mount Vesuvius when it's on the verge of a volcanic eruption. And when everyone else can't get around because it's covered in smoke and ash, he's able to get around just fine. He travels almost entirely overland in Russia in rickety carts. 
what else does he do? He goes to Equatorial Guinea on ship. And one of his tricks to show people that he was perfectly capable of handling himself was when he would get on the ship as a former sailor, he knew every square inch of one. He would immediately climb up to the top of the crow's nest there and wave to everyone below just to immediately cut down any thought that he wasn't capable of handling himself. So he becomes a best-selling author writing his uh, travel logs. He's noted by people like Charles Darwin as having the best knowledge of the flora and fauna of the Indies. He has his own entry in the World Book Encyclopedia, I think up to the 1870s or 1880s. He goes on uh, elephant hunts in Sri Lanka. Just absolutely remarkable person in every single way. So there is a lot that I could imagine covering his life. And if we were to commit it to Phil, my dream is Netflix or Hulu miniseries. We're a couple of years past the age where streaming services were throwing ridiculous amounts of money at any series that would pop up. So it may be a little harder to green light this, but I think this deserves something like that. I know Netflix did a Marco Polo series a few years ago. I heard it was terrible. They were trying to give it the Game of Thrones treatment and think, okay, people watch it if we just throw in gratuitous graphic nudity for no reason than to spice up the plot. So I'm not saying to make it like that. I'm saying that historical dramas like that of Explorers have been done. So something along those lines, we've in cameos of historical figures there, British royalty, Russian czars, Charles Darwin, whoever else. I didn't really care one way or another with casting. Steve, having spent so much time with film, probably knows how the Hollywood process works. And you always have greasy producers who are trying to make things easier for not so smart audience members to understand. A producer is always imagining, how can a IQ80 dummy who I want to get their money take this? So I thought, well, who's someone who's appeared in other properties who played a competent blind man? And I would just cast Charlie Cox, who was in the Netflix Daredevil series. I don't know, just make it easier for viewers to mentally glom on to what sort of character this is supposed to be. Other than that, I didn't have strong opinions. This is probably the first anyone's ever heard of James Holman. I mean, he had a large beard, but other than that, a fairly standard British bloke. So that's who I would pitch. Tell me if my idea is good or terrible, or if you have some studio notes for me. So he sounds kind of like a 19th century blind version of Forrest Gump, where he's traveling around the world and just <laughs> seeing all these. I mean, it doesn't sound like he had a you know, mental slowness the way Forrest Gump did. But yeah, very interesting. And when I click on his photo, his portrait rather, he's got the beard. He's got kind of a young face. He's holding a cane, which he's probably using for the echolocation. And he's got the beard. And I'm honestly thinking, I don't know what vibe you're looking for in this movie, but he kind of looks a little bit like Seth Rogen. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> maybe the young version of him. Yeah, so this is going to be a historical period stoner comedy very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Are you thinking more dramatic or whimsical? Whimsical like around the world in 80 days? Or Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because if the around the world in 80 days, part of it is the character is, what's the name? Of, does anyone know off the top of their head? Isn't it Phineas Fogg or? Thank you. I figured the group of us would know the trivia is like that. So Phineas Fogg, he's a very whimsical, odd character. He's taking advantage of cutting edge steamship, railway technology, but he's also in competition. People are trying to undercut him and sabotage him and all this. And there was a little bit of that with James Holman, where other travel writers of the time are sniping at him. Maybe they're jealous of their success. He's also a lot scrappier than them because he figured out how to travel around the world on a budget. So when he goes across almost the entire Eurasian continent, he's doing it in rickety horse carts throughout Siberia, whereas other people are part of the aristocracy. They're going on first class travel in their fancy ships. So they look down on him from a class perspective. And there's a whole slander campaign against him where people say, well, he's a blind man. And yes, he's a best selling author, but there's no way what he did could really be an accomplishment because. How could what he did be an accomplishment if it could be done by a blind man? So it's this tautology, total circular reasoning. But yeah, it kind of sticks. And he does have some factual errors in his writings. But I mean, everybody did at that time. I mean, Marco Polo is talking about dog-headed creatures and, you know, different in Taiwan and whatnot. So everyone had factual errors back then. It was just hard to fact check stuff. 
So that kind of around the world in 80 days aspect of it sort of existed. I mean, I think of the full on, you know, drama of like, what does BBC do? They have that series Poldark of the aristocrat in Cornwall who's trying to deal with different machinations. I mean, really any kind of BBC historical thing. All Creatures Great and Small is a little bit more on the whimsical side of this veterinarian in the 1930s. Downton Abbey is heavier on the drama. So I would go a little bit heavier on the drama side than at All Creatures Great and Small side of things. But I mean, whatever, I'm wish casting. By the time it's churned through a greasy producer's fingers, it's going to be CGI and there's going to be, I don't know, steampunk robots and all that stuff in there. So what do I know? I'll share with you, Scott, my choice as or the lead actor that popped into my mind when I saw your idea. It was, and he's not even British, so he'd have to have the British accent, is Kevin Klein. I mean, Dick Van Tye could do it, so other Americans could do it. I saw his age and saw, oh goodness, he's 75 years old, so I think he might be a bit old, but that's the actor that came to mind, Kevin Klein. Digital de-aging. It could be like the Irishman. Well, you know, Robert De Niro, 80 years old. So, yeah. I mean, you can, like, some characters could just be straight up CGI now. Death doesn't have to, or age doesn't have to stop anything from happening anymore. You know, I would watch this movie. I mean, he seems like a fascinating guy. It's going to be a window into the world in the early 19th century. Literally the whole world. And here's a guy, I mean, just he has a compelling story. I mean, in a time when technology was limited compared to today, he was able to get around and almost have like a superhuman ability. So I'd watch this movie. I mean, I'd watch George Washington first, that movie, but then I would watch this movie too. Yeah, it's name recognition does have letter. Well, yeah, so that's my James Holman pitch. But I would also watch a Norman Borlaug movie as well. Yeah. Going back to our previous episode. Plus, there's plenty of space in a movie like that to add in, to throw in a love interest or a jerky editor or something that he's always fighting against. And then you get the drama aspect, you have the love interest, all the other things that need to get shoehorned into something like this. And, it, you know, then you have your next blockbuster hit and traveling the world like he does you could get financing from many different countries so that would help boost the budget sort of like how the after kazakhstan was trying to recover from the embarrassment of borat they financed this genghis khan movie (laughs) in 2006 which it's a really good movie they didn't recover from borat but we have that to thank for it so if we can have them appear in different countries and the Sri Lankan Ministry of Tourism can kick in some investment funds, there you this go. thing will practically pay for itself. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't just a remake of The Conqueror. Is that the John Wayne flick? Or? Yeah, the John Wayne biopic on Genghis Khan. Best cast movie of all time. Oh, yeah, no, you don't remake a classic like that. I've devoted two whole episodes to that movie. I think we talked about that, didn't we, Steve? Yeah, I don't think we're allowed to go through a Parthenon collaboration without mentioning the Conqueror at least <laughs> once, no matter the subject. Speaking of mustaches, wow. <laughs> I mean, I was surprised when I found out that John Wayne wasn't Asian. I saw him in other Westerns and thought, I feel a little conflicted about the white face they're doing with him here, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there was a single Asian in that movie. No, it's a uh, Wow. So yeah, listeners, just go on YouTube and look for clips of The Conqueror. I don't recommend watching the entire thing. I've done it a couple times. I had to do it at double speed because it's such a slog. But yeah, it'll blow your mind just thinking that this is a thing that existed and was made. That's all I have to say. And then wasn't that the movie they filmed it next to a a nuclear testing facility and everybody died from it? (laughs) Oh, they just got horrible cancer. That's all. It wasn't immediate death. It just gets worse and worse. All right, so we saved Richard, who actually pitched this idea for historical films. So we saved his pitch for last. Let's hear what you have to sell us, Richard. Absolutely. Okay, so my movie would center upon the story of Woodrow and Edith Wilson. And I've always found Edith Wilson's story very compelling because you have a woman who ended up becoming what historians consider the first acting woman president in history. Not officially, but 
in effect. And her story is all the more interesting because this was not something that she ever schemed or plotted to do. She was basically a DC socialite, if that. I mean, when I say socialite, it kind of a loose term for that. But here's a woman who was from Virginia. She was married to a jewelry salesman and he dies and she's a widow, but ends up basically running the business, taking it over and making it profitable. And meanwhile, she befriends people in the orbit of Woodrow Wilson, who was president at the time. And she was relatively apolitical. Woodrow Wilson, his first wife dies while he's president. And it's obviously a devastating moment for him. And the whole White House is a scene of, it's just a very morose place at the time. And Wilson's cousin and his physician know that this is a terrible time for him. And he's very stressed out because he's president, but also specifically because he's dealing with a lot of crises in Europe and World War One, And he's also dealing with a crisis back home with Mexico. And during that time, they say, hey, let's introduce him to this lady, this widow, Edith Wilson. And they kind of set them up and bring her to the White House. And he's absolutely smitten. So there's the romance side of it. But at the same time, it's great because these are complicated figures. Woodrow Wilson, as we know, was once a respected president and some historians still respect him today. But he was a person who was basically a neo-Confederate and did all sorts of horrible things that he segregated the federal government and his era, his presidency, even though it's considered a progressive presidency, it ended up really becoming regressive in terms of racial progress in the United States. And so he's this complicated figure. Edith falls in love, or he falls in love with Edith, proposes to her. She says no, but he's persistent. And the fact that she says no showed that she wasn't like power hungry woman trying to get power. But eventually they do get married. And then he suffers a stroke and he suffers a stroke as he's trying to convince the American people to ratify, to support his League of Nations, which is his plan to not just end World War One officially, but to prevent all future wars from ever happening. So he's got this major messiah complex and he has a stroke. And now Edith Wilson is afraid that if her husband gets too stressed out as president, that he's going to die. So she takes up a lot of his work and she, in effect, becomes America's first acting woman president. I actually interviewed his biographer recently, and she said that she thinks the title is legit. First acting woman president, unofficially, but nonetheless, was basically doing more than what maybe a chief of staff would have done as president. And one of the great ironies of this is that all of this happens right as women secure the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. And at the same time, they and no one else had any idea that there was a woman actually running the show. And another irony is that Edith Wilson was not a suffragist. She very much disdained the suffragists. So ironies all abound. Now, as far as who would play them, for Woodrow Wilson, I choose Benedict Cumberbatch because, first of all, he kind of has this long face. He's played historical figures before. He played Alan Turing in the movie Imitation Game. And so he's used to playing haughty, elitist academics, brilliant men. And that's what Woodrow Wilson, that's who he was. And when I was watching Wonder Woman, the first one with Gal Gadot in 2007, there's a sidekick, kind of comic relief sidekick. It's actually Chris Pine's assistant, his character's assistant. Her name, the character name is Etta Candy, but the actress, British actress named Lucy Davis. And as soon as I saw her, first of all, she was kind of dressed like a suffragette from the time. But when I saw her, I immediately thought, that's my Edith Wilson. That is her. So I would choose Benedict Cumberbatch and Lucy Davis to play them. And in addition to that, I was talking to a friend of mine about this. And so then the question is, do you play it serious? Do you play it straight or do you play it as comedy? And there's definitely a weekend at Bernie's kind of potential here because there's literally a scene. When I say a scene, this actually happened in history where Woodrow Wilson is totally He's basically totally immobilized for the last year and a half of his presidency. And people start getting suspicious. Edith Wilson covers it up. 
And the Congress starts getting suspicious. So they actually send a delegation to visit Wilson to talk about a very specific subject. I think it was Mexico, a treaty with Mexico. But anyways, they go there. And so Edith Wilson and the Dr. Alan Grayson, they're all freaking out about what to do because Congress is going to see Wilson is not functioning. But they kind of coach Wilson and they kind of set it up where the delegation would meet Wilson, but it would be in a dark room where they couldn't really see him very well. And they just kind of tell Wilson what to say. And it plays out exactly the way, you know, it's planned where these congressmen go and meet him. And Wilson, it's in a dark room and they see him and he basically like somehow he musters the strength to deliver exactly what the congressmen, you know, what they needed to hear. And the congressmen see him. They're like, oh, I guess he's okay." But in reality, he's just kind of propped up and made to look okay, even though he's not really okay. But it's very weekend at Bernie's. And it's great because I was telling a friend about it and he literally said, you can make the movie, you can call it Weekend at Woodrow's. And he actually, if we want to play it as a comedy, instead of Lucy Davis playing Edith Wilson, we could have Rebel Wilson playing Edith Wilson. (laughs) But if we want to make it serious, I think Lucy Davis would be perfect for the role. She was in the British office, wasn't she? And now a word from our sponsors. Lucy Davis. Yes, I believe she was. Yes. Yeah. But anyways, there you go. That is my Woodrow and Edith Wilson. And I think honestly, you could sell it. I mean, there's always been this fascination about, you know, when is America going to have, you know, her first woman president and all that. And one day if it happens, it's going to be this big deal and all that stuff. But you can tell you can sell it as, hey, America kind of did have a woman president at one point. Here's the movie. And so there you go. You can either go the comedic route with Rebel Wilson or you could go the serious route with Lucy Davis. But I would need Benedict Cumberbatch in it. That's my main, what do you call it, condition. So anyways, there you go. That's my movie. Well, I'm going to give you a thumbs up on the choice of Benedict. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, everything I I mean, he's played these like kind of like neurotic geniuses that you just don't really like, but they're very complex and fascinating. If that isn't Woodrow Wilson, I don't know what is. Like Sherlock Holmes. Exactly. Exactly. Played Sherlock for seven or eight years. It's like Benedict is no question could do it as an actor, but picture this that I've seen of Woodrow Wilson. He is a hideously ugly man. And I thought, do you need to go for the casting route of someone who really gets cast for looking weird, like a Steve Buscemi or Willem Dafoe? (laughs) I was thinking too, another one that's a little outside of the box is Rami Malek who was also an Oppenheimer. And then for an Egyptian-American actor to play it, I mean, that would set Woodrow Wilson spinning like a lathe in his grave. So (laughs) consider that. Which I all think we're okay with. You mentioned, Richard, his ranking has gone down over the past few years. I think he's getting it from both sides right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, conservatives have abhorred him for a while. But now, I mean, I'm not a fan of violently taking down names and statues, but I didn't really shed a tear when Princeton got rid of the Woodrow Wilson name for their school. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, C-SPAN rankings, and in 2000, he was number six. And in 2021, he's down to number 13. And I'm guessing back then, a few decades ago, he was lumped in with the Achievements of the progressive era, so he's seen as being someone who's bringing America to the world stage, suffrage, yada, yada. But for the reasons we mentioned, his rank is going down. And I think another reason he was so high for so long, and this ties into the character of Edith, Edith didn't die until the 60s. And after Wilson's death, she was his hype woman for the rest of her life. So any important building, anything that's dedicated to him, anything that happens, she was there. This is what her biographer mentioned. And so for decades and decades and decades, you had a kind of like how the rapper has his hype man. Woodrow has his hype woman. So it really goes to show that there's human connections of what someone's reputation is when you have someone that's a one woman army pushing it. So that was one thing that made me think of a casting choice. If there's anyone who can really bring that Yoko Ono energy, that kind of Machiavellian scheming to the table. I don't know what actress really comes out to me, but someone who has that kind of energy, I think could really capture the spirit of who Edith Wilson was. That's a good point. Maybe the woman from Gone Girl, she's pretty scheming. I don't think she looks anything like, 
I don't think she looks anything like a Rosamund Pike, but I was terrified of her character in that movie. I like the Yoko Ono reference. I mean, I was thinking Jackie Kennedy because she was the one that, you know, did the whole Camelot thing for JFK. But you're right. Edith was his greatest advocate and she lived to see JFK elected. In fact, when I was living in Virginia, I would have to drive over Woodrow Wilson Bridge every now and then and just daydream about that movie that I wanted to make about Woodrow Wilson and Edith Wilson. He was the last Virginia born president, right? Yes. Yes, he was. Yeah. But yeah. And, you know, Woodrow Wilson is a president that I think people forget that they talk about the New Deal under FDR, a Wilson acolyte. They talk about the Great Society under Johnson. But Woodrow Wilson really laid the foundation for that. His new freedom policy gave us the Federal Reserve. It gave us income taxes. It gave us the Federal Trade Commission. And that's not even talking about his foreign policy stuff, which is most famous for. So in terms of consequential presidents, he's about as high as any president. But of course, people kind of lump all of that under FDR or Johnson. But FDR was really trying to continue Wilson's vision. And the 1912 election, he actually beat out TR. He did. Who was running as a third party candidate. Although I tend to look at it as TR kind of beat himself because he ran splitting the ticket that I think otherwise the Republicans usually had a majority. He ran as a bull moose candidate. But at any rate, yeah, I mean, that was that basically, I think, set Wilson up to win. But yeah, I just think it would be a fascinating movie because you have two fascinating figures. And I think there is, you know, a bit of a I mean, not to say that I'd really like to see Woodrow Wilson in any romantic context. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that he was absolutely over the moon about Edith Wilson. And Edith Wilson was a quite charming woman that people said good things about. But then here you have a situation where she's hiding her husband's health and concealing what's really happening for the American people. And for the rest of her life kind of concealed what she called her stewardship. She said it was a stewardship where she was kind of taking up some of his roles in caretaking the presidency. But on her own right, she's a fascinating woman. She was the first woman president who didn't want women to vote and who served as president right when the suffrage movement was coming to fruition. I've always been aware of this story. And a few years ago, I was in a DVD store, maybe 10 years ago, and I saw a DVD cover or box for a movie, and it was written in large letters, Wilson. And there was a woman on the cover. And I was in a rush, and without turning the DVD around and reading about the movie, I thought, oh, that must be... President Wilson's wife, and that's what the movie must be about. Interesting. So I grabbed it. And when I watched it months later, I realized it was a PBS film or PBS drama about a woman named Wilson and had absolutely nothing to do with the president of the United States. But it was still a good movie. Was it about the wife of Mr. Wilson from Dennis the Menace? (laughs) Oh, no. No, it wasn't that one. It's the only thing I could think of. Yeah, I'm thinking more about this. And from what I've read of, about Edith, that she sounds like a fairly normal person who was put into extraordinary circumstances. And exactly. It's not like she's trying to mastermind anything. But I got to say, from an entertainment standpoint, I really like just going full Gone Girl, Rosamund Pike, and just push it hard in that direction where Edith is basically like a. Ottoman Empire Sultan's mother who arranges for one son to be executed so that she can get her son on the throne and be this total narcissistic Machiavellian Nietzschean mastermind behind the screen. I think that'd be pretty entertaining, if not necessarily historically accurate. I love it. And if that's the case, we have to have Seth Rogen as Woodrow Wilson. Yeah, let's just do it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Take a couple more liberties. Yes. Well, I think each one of our guests today has really made a great case for uh, pitching movies that are historical. Some are a little, we could take them in many different avenues, but I think there's some solid choices there. And I know we would all love to hear your thoughts on historical movies that you think should be made. Now, we'll start with Richard. Where can people find your podcast, This American President?, if they'd like to learn more. Yeah, basically anywhere you can get listen to your podcast. You can go on 
Spotify, on your podcast app. But we're This American President. We have a website, thisamericanpresident.com. And Scott, where can we find History Unplugged? History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice. And I think it's historyunpluggedpodcast.com. So check it out. And Mark. Well, both my podcasts can be found on all platforms and at markvnet.com. And I've been Steve, who's been playing your host today. I am the host of the History of the Papacy podcast and the new Organized Crime and Punishment podcast, a history and true crime podcast, which you can find on all the places where you find good podcasts. I want to thank Richard, Mark, and Scott for coming on today. If you want to learn more about the Parthenon Podcast Network and all of the great shows that are featured there, you can go over to ParthenonPodcast.com and we will talk to you next time.